The hip hop writer is a creator, composing understanding words of cultured brilliance, powering a rebalance of the elements equally. Pages of rejuvenated reaffirmation, simply the almighty leadership of insightful craft work that stands to build through any confrontation born to be. Yet his daily duties as a journalist that questions properly and uses his ears to filter the real. And as the art decays by dilution, he concentrates the best again and again, exposing it in the print. Today's journalist and tomorrow's historian, he listens to share. Here is that necessary attempt executed again and again and again. This is the Power Rise Show on S Street Media. This is your brother, the lone low life with the home sewn garment. The Boricua with the build, the true and living God stepping in score. Soon years Allah, a.k.a. Skill straight low. And we're on S Street Media, the evolution of media, where every intrigue will have its own show, where every incredible thought will have its own episode, and every timeless insight will be archived. And as I always say, this show is about my element of hip-hop, what I like to call the writer of art on art and science on music. The only show in history on this hip-hop writer element that I, a veteran of over a quarter century, helped pioneer. And as always, we're followed by the great intro, intro by the legendary Kevlar 7, my brother, remembered in perfection, R.I.P., joint called I Call My Brother Son. It was given to me just for this show. So uh, as we begin, though, let's begin with the things I'm giving you. Books out the reel of 2020 which really encapsulates this entire universe, those 70-page analysis of the best musicians and artists in hip-hop music today, bracketed in my own created revolutionary new system of ciphers that categorize the entire musical universe. It doesn't matter if it's real of 2020. This is what is current right now, and it is bracketed. Everything that you're seeing right now, it basically puts everything up to date, and it is only $5.00. Plus, what if I, guaranteed $5 you get it, though, whatever donation you give to me. Cash app, Sunez, leave your email, I got you. PayPal, me at Sunez, I got you. And um, I also have in print the Filtered Reel, Essays from the Invisible Renaissance, which is really the only book that details these very first 10 years of the era I am calling the Invisible Renaissance, that is the 2010s into today, all the great mu music, all the great musicians, focusing on a specific year again with other essays surrounding it, detailing the entire history with essays, seminal essays, ideas, and even um, which what became very useful to many people a particular list of great MCs in this invisible renaissance, which is being added to daily. And that's why I wrote the quick ebook and decided to share that quick ebook, The Real of 2020, to add on all of the new legendary, soon to be legendary and great voices that are, are making music today. But those books are out though. You can contact me at sunyez97 at gmail.com or on sunyez, S U N E Z, on the IG, sunyez7, number seven that is, on the Twitter. You know, contact me. You know what I mean? Let me know what you're thinking and all that kind of stuff. Also, too, before we get into this show, the, oh man, a very tough show. <laughs> um, I want to shout out. My brother, DJ Toshi, as always. My partner show, Classic Storm Radio. We did our last show, episode 290, with uh, two MCs I think are incredible. If they're not in your collection and you're a collector of today's music, though, you have a gaping hole. A gaping hole. You know what I mean? You're like today's NBA. You know, they shoot threes, but they can't shoot a damn 15-footer, right? That's today's NBA. That's your collection. You don't have ribs. You're today's NBA. You know what I mean? It's like, who's that guy in the Nets, though, right? He can shoot threes, but he can't shoot... Um, He shoots horrible free throws. What the fuck is up with that? You know what I mean? The white dude on the... Uh, on the nets that shoots, uh, he lights out on three, but he can't shoot free throws very well. 
I don't know, it's some alternate universe here, you know what I mean? But uh, we did our show, we did Spit Gems, FU, They Are Ribs, Rikers Island Boxing School, one of the great albums of this year. It doesn't matter what else comes out, though, that's going to be on the list. It doesn't matter what comes out, that will be on many people's top five, if not the best record. So uh, you'll want to do the knowledge and, and really some details of their career and everything like that. And um, and I'll be, I'll be referencing them for a particular point that I want to make that has nothing to do with them later. But uh, shout out to those brothers. Peace to those brothers. Uh, DJ Toshi. Go to DJ Toshi Classic Storm. T-O-S-H-I. DJ Toshi Classic Storm. Uh, dot, uh, dot Podomatic and uh, do the knowledge, you know what I mean? Um, if not, go to my IG, all those links are there. Classic Storm Radio on the IG. Also, I always like to addend to my last uh, show, show 86, show 86, my last show with Marcano, aka Power Rule of the Leftovers, you know what I mean? We're, I'm part of the Leftovers, NYC. So, we had a discussion about what this music means to us, what it means to be an anti gentrification group. And what it meant to be part of, for me, what it meant to be part of this album, part of Marcano's movement that he is leading, and the incredible work that he did by making, um, to me, one of the great anthemic albums. You know, I just mentioned Ribs, and I mentioned uh, The Leftovers' NYC debut album, Engraved in New York. Those are two of the great anthemic albums albums of this year you know what i mean if you want to know what the vibe is you know what the vibe is as a warrior this year you got to start with those records you know what i mean and um we had a great build you know what i mean and um we'll be building again soon on, on, on other things and all of that so uh go back to that and you know we're, we're a diehard met fans you know what i mean so it was crazy to us that we were show 86 you know 86 mets you know what i mean that was dope. <laughs> that, that was just dope. You know what I mean? In fact, we were supposed to have, I was supposed to have him show a long time ago, though. Well, we deliberately canceled and did this on purpose, though. No, but we didn't. But that's how it ended up. But hey, I'm trying to make it more chippy, more cheery, but really what I'm going to do is make it more angry because it could get depressed right now. This show, I'm calling the Dark Ages Volume 3 build because you don't have a whole bunch of them. You know, the Dark Ages. What I call the 2000s. Like I tell people, if you were having fun with music and you thought everything was hunky-dory and you loved every page of The Source and you loved every page of Double XL throughout the 2000s, though, you know what I mean? If you thought that 50 Cent was a prophet, you know, if you thought Eminem was a legend and he was the top tier of the game, then you, you, you are a victim of the Dark Ages. You're a victim. If you thought Missy Elliott, though, was a genius, you were a victim of the Dark Ages. If you thought the Beats, but I don't know, you know, I could be picking on people, Timberland, Swizz, Beats, whoever it was, you know. If you thought those were next level, iconic productions, you were lost in the Dark Ages. The dark ages are a very confusing time. It's when the music explodes in popularity. It's when the hip-hop media and when hip-hop music and everything that's branded close to it explodes. Explodes monetarily. Issues of the source start looking like Vogue magazine. You know what I mean? Like Cosmo, Bride, you know, like... Brides magazine, you know, they start looking thick as fuck, you know what I mean? 300 page magazines, you know what I mean? But not one page will be dedicated though to the leaders of that whole era. People talk shit, they want to they want to sweat and they want to sweat producers now. They goes, oh yeah, I love Alchemist. I love Alchemist though. Find me the articles about Alchemist in the 2000s. <laughs> right? That's, a, that's like a Jeopardy question, right? 
<laughs> right? Um, find me any articles about doom. <laughs> Nothing. Um, everybody's sweating Jay Dilla. Find me articles about Jay Dilla. In 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004. You know, before he died. Before he died. Find me something in, in, the, in, in the major magazines about Dilla. Nah. Nothing. How about Mad Lib? Yeah, how about Mad Lib? West Coast. You know, everything West Coast is popular, right? Not like, you know, New York, so underground and stuff. Nah. No, you're not going to find anything there. No. What about that massive feature that these magazines did about a mad villain? Nah. Not going to find that either in there. What about the features? About the movements? The features about the music becoming independent. You know what I mean? Don Pacino. Core Mega. I mentioned Core Mega very cleverly here. I want to say something positive about him. Because he had some tweets today that I didn't like. I, I didn't agree with. You know what I mean? I might mention them, though, if I get up to it, though. Again, today's an angry show. Cause it's the only way to talk about the Dark Ages and not be saddened by so much death. You know what I mean? I want to put these in perspective for you. Because people, they like to give homage, though. In a hagiograph, you know, you know, the hagiograph, they, they make a Jesus Christ story out of people that didn't do that shit. Or they say other things that are extreme or, or not really true or they try to be nice, you know what I mean? But um, I want to talk about all of this stuff. This episode is being driven and inspired by and necessary and, and you know I was telling my producer off air man I tried not to talk about this shit <laughs> let's avoid this let's just talk about the great artists today though I booked countless artists though you know one of them you know he took a trip he went to to another you know he took a trip he moved he's not in New York anymore so he's like oh I prefer the physical I was like oh that's peace you know I understand no phone? Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, that's peace. Um, of course, you know, get contact with somebody else, though. But they go, no, I'm coming through later in the month so, or later in two months. So we'll meet up then. All right. All right. Um, next guest, they give me a, a better date. They, you know, it's a better date. How about I do something in May? So, you know, you got stuck with me talking about the dark ages here. But really because we have to talk about the deaths of two who I consider MCs that did not make music that I particularly cared for or loved. I'm being, I gotta keep it real. I gotta keep it real. Not some phony shit. You know what I mean? And yet I will tell you that the deaths of DMX and Black Rob, they saddened me because they prophes they bring to fruition things that I said at the point of their selling. And that means before you, listener, ever heard these artists, I was disagreeing with the way that they were packaged. You see? And that's why I said my perspective is different because sometimes the packaging of the artist, you know, because when, when you're in the media in the major, and you're seeing things at the major magazines, you're seeing things packaged and... It's packaged so gruesomely, so disgustingly, so opportunistically and against that artist's well-being that you actually, in the back of your mind, it's messed up, but you're like, I hope this guy doesn't blow up or this artist must be fake because he's being packaged in such a horribly cliche way. You know what I mean? Or you could see that the artist is getting no support, no support from profession to profession. Let me say that again. This is a hip hop thing. The artist needs support from profession to profession. You know why that's the case? It may not be the case with Barry White. 
He did his bid and he comes out and he gets into the recording studio and he says, this is it for me. But they didn't tell Barry White, Barry White, I want you to keep that same hood energy and I want you to sing songs, make some dance songs about the streets, about how it was to stick them up and how it was in, in the cell block. Did they tell that to Barry White? Does Barry White, you know, is that what he was monologuing in the beginning of the shit? Oh, yeah, this is my Barry White. I can't go deeper than that. Maybe the producer can help my vocals here. You know what I mean? But was he talking about it? He's like, I got so much crime to give. You know what I mean? Nah, none of that. Lonely in the jail cell, none of that. But the profession to profession transition is much more different for the MC, particularly the MC that they are selling. Because they by, by the 90s when I get in the game, they're not selling DJs. And in these dark ages, the 2000s, they're not selling DJs. It doesn't matter if they succeed like R RJD2. Remember him? This guy made a whole career of instrumentals, though. They weren't selling you... <coughs> excuse me. They weren't selling you LP. Right? They weren't selling you progressive stuff. No, they were selling you... The street nigger life. And I'm saying nigger with the ER. The nigger life. That's what they were selling you. And that's what these bios read like. Bios from the label. Meaning that I don't have to write anything. I'm going to write down and take chunks out of this though. You know how lazy that was? That's how you do it back then. That's how you do it back then. That's why every article you read sounds the same too. And that's why the editors, they want it easy like that so they could transition. Put it down the conveyor belt. Let's put this down the conveyor belt, and we have the same guy come up again. And oh no, his articles are a little bit different, though. And guess who's who knows this by actual fact? Me, because everything I wrote, I was deliberately trying to write something different. And he said, "Hey, listen, you're writing this stuff a little too different. We gotta change it." And because everything's a factory, it's a factory output, and that's not just in the music magazines. That's everywhere in the magazines. That's why there are very few voices. The special voices are being kept for the, for the column. And that's why we were able to see Bones Malone really, really shine. You know what I mean? Because he had the power to get his own column. That's why the column was always the holy grail. The column was always the holy grail. Because you got to write robotic everywhere else. May, maybe the feature of an artist you could... Write something clever to intro him, you know? And then everybody would waste it, though. They talk about, uh, before, as I was waiting for Havoc and Mob Deep to show up, though, the light of the sun was beaming on the concrete. And they try to write some clever shit that has nothing to do with what they're going to talk about. You know what I mean? Try to get poetic, artistic, but it has nothing to do with the artist. So I always found problems with that, too. But there wasn't much for a writer to do without sounding generic. And they uh, shoveled it up. You get that bio, copy and paste, put that in there, that's who this is. And I'm going to say first, remembered imperfection. Re that, so that they be revered in positivity. DMX and Black Rob. A lot of the stories you hear from people are real true stories of goodwill, peace vibes, good people, you know, trying to make a career in something else. But I say this, right? <clears throat> There's a concept that our people say, and I always have to say this to preface. They say, um... Don't speak ill of the dead. And or only focusing on speaking well of the dead. Speak well of the dead, not the issues that they're, and certainly not even the issues that their deaths raise. And I'm telling you, though, that I'm a historian. So I'm going to talk about that shit. I'm going to tell you the good and the bad. I'm going to put this in a context. We 
one of the contexts that people have been putting out, especially, you know, particularly with Black Rob, but I really do think it applies to, to DMX in many ways as well, but not with a particular individual, is the evil puffy thing, you know what I mean? And the trials and tribulations that all of the people that Puffy put on and what they went through. And I'm saying that's the black excellence that you wanted. You know what I mean? I said this, right? I tweeted this. I said, now everyone has critiques of Diddy and or the industry as we star as we see stars return to the essence, pass away. I properly named the 2000s the Dark Ages because, because nearly all fans, yeah, all you fans, fuck the fans too, right? Fuck them. Sellout rappers, pseudo journalists, embraced big wigs, and adored the flimsy twigs they let y'all grasp. And that's a respect, respect fake truth. You loved it. You loved it. I was there. I was there. How many people I interviewed? I can't tell you how many people I interviewed, though, horrified me. They horrified me. They're doing boom bap, and then five minutes later, I talk to them and say, "Let me do an interview with you." You know, for my you know my little publications, whether it was the ones I made up, the ones I was trying to pitch, <laughs> right? And they said, "Yeah, yeah, you know, maybe with this though, Diddy can see what I'm doing though." Or like, "Oh, uh, <coughs> this is what Master P's and and Low Limit is doing, so I gotta do this." So you're not gonna make good music. You're gonna make Lots of bad music and put extra bad music on the album and fill it up to 77 minutes and, and, and 45 seconds, right? Remember? No limit records, though. They go all the way to the end, though. You can't scratch any piece of that shit. You have to hold the DVD like this, you know? You got to hold the DVD like this. You can't hold it from the bottom because the whole shit is, is songs. <coughs> Just filler. Filler. I'm going to tell you something, though, how I was on the ball. My first published piece, though, was in college. And the name of the title was The Three R's That Feed and Starve Hip Hop. That's what it was called. And the subtitle was Record Labels, R&B, and Radio. Now, tell me I don't hit hard, though. That's my first piece, though. That, that hits hard, though. You know what I mean? That first piece I had, though, was a Zion layup, like a Zion Williamson layup. You know what I'm saying? That shit went in. You know what I mean? Give me 2,500 words, though. Get the fuck out the way. And I, I Zion William lay, laid it up. I was angry from page one, article one. The record labels. The record labels. You cannot blame any one man for another man's entire life. So it doesn't make sense to blame Diddy for like, oh, he killed Black Rob. You know what I mean? Like, he killed him, you know? That's just nuts. But I'll tell you something, he didn't help. He didn't help. If the man died young, no, and years were shaved off, he shaved off some of them. Let me tell you what he did. I find it ludicrous. You know, when somebody dies, though, and people put a context, Black Rob was a talent who was able to do exactly what they were asking for MCs to do in this dark ages. We don't want you to rhyme, though. We want everything to have your essence, and we need catchy shit. Catchy shit. Make a jingle out of your entire hood life. And the master of it all, all time, is probably DMX. The master of it all, all time, is probably DMX. I, I, you know, brothers have baby mamas, they have... We got all this kind of hell, though. We always go every now and then, what these bitches want from a nigga. You know what I mean? Like, right? We always do that. 
These are these are real life put into catchy courses. Stop, drop, set them up, shop, right, whatever, right? That's the streets. My producer here is all the way legal. And yet that course still applies to the way he maneuvers himself. You know what I mean? Get your WB merchandise. How do you think WB merchandise is moving though? Stop, drop, set them up, shop. That's the way, that's the way you do it. The, this is the hood, the streets, the griminess though. This is the shit that people that are not part of it want to relate to. And the music transforms itself because the artists that start to come out there are smarter. They're smarter than the easy ease. Ludacris has a degree in giving you shit that sounds stupid. He has more college education about this industry than me. You know what I mean? How can I give him something more frivolous? I learned this. What do they want? What these labels want? And we give them the, what would they want. So these are masters. Me personally, I will say this. DMX is an all-time live MC. Easily can put him on the top of any list. My all-time, though, is what I'm going to talk about later. But he's up there with the Buster Rhymes, Method Man's, Karis ones. You know what I mean? As people have been sharing that clip, he didn't need a heavy light show. You know what I mean? He didn't need explosions at the side. You know what I mean? To make the shit sound hype. It's a master. He's a master MC. One of the last that really comes from the street, not just doing the crimes that that the 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 audience lusts for. They lust for this. I need to hear crime. I need to hear violence. I need to hear a black man kill other black men. I need to hear that. I fiend for it. You know what I mean? I know that the, when they saw that cover of DMX drenched in blood, that is that black blood that they took? Is that real blood? Because the, the, the albums I was listening to with my white angst in suburbia, the blood usually would be a bat head's blood. You know what I mean? It'd be a, from a bat. Is that real black blood on him? You know what I mean? And better, hey, is it his blood? Hey, it should be his blood or a combination of those of those things. That's what they were selling you. I was at the labels. I was reading these press releases and they sound like, wait a minute, Tupac just died and 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 you, you, you're selling us this and they're selling it because they say, hey, DMX, if you feel comfortable, take that shirt off anytime you want. Anytime you want, take that shirt off. They support that. DMX, I want you to be a real nigger at all times. All times. And if it means, though, that you might drug yourself to death, be prolific in the studio. <laughs> and I'll say it. I really feel that they released two albums because they thought they would kill him already. Those 98 albums, they pushed it out. I'd never seen anything. Remember, we never saw anything like that. Never saw anything like that. There's two things that you didn't see back then. And that two of the MCs that died on us very quickly, you saw. You never saw more than one album a year. And mind you, this, it would, today's equivalent, it would probably be four albums because it was long. They're long. They're long. Very long. And you never saw MCs doing as many features as possible. That's what Pun was doing. That's what Pun was doing. He's trying to do a feature with everybody. Remember Pun and Noriega, they're joking on the skit? Well, Pun is saying, I'll do any song with any nigga. I don't give a fuck. I don't care if I don't like him. Let's get that money. Right? They knew that the lifestyles of these artists 
might not give them production for a long period of time. So, you know, let, let's, uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, let, let's exploit them as fast as possible. Can we get you in the studio? And Tupac sets a precedent for that because they realized that Tupac was making, you could argue, there's many arguments. I don't think Tupac was making mass amounts of music because he thought he was going to die. That's, that's corny and that's serializing the actual lyrics he was giving you though. You know what I mean? If I die tonight, so I'm making a thousand songs. Like, that shit's stupid. He was literally trying to get out of the death row contract. Okay? All of the research I've seen, that's more likely trying to get out of the death row contract. He wanted uh, opportunities to do his own stuff. He was doing the One Nation album on the East Coast. There's a lot of things that he was doing and Tupac was shifting into being an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> Certainly what we would call branding because he was doing the acting, he was doing all these different things, right? But if you read the way that they were pitching DMX in the beginning, the way that they were showing him, the way that they were using him, it was to replace the Tupac that people wanted though. One nigga dies, we got the open door. Who is the next nigga? Ice Cube said it. He said they'll have a new nigga next year. Remember, he did this, you know, he did the spin move. Remember, he spin move. And he becomes, you know, he's all hammered out. Remember? True to the game, though. By the way, my, I think probably my favorite, my second favorite video of all time. You know? Second favorite video of all time. You know what I mean? Mass Appeal is my favorite because of the grit, the, the vibe. I just love the grit that, that Guru had with everything. But um, what, true, what I, Ice Cube said is so true. And in 1994, I was, I was saying this. And when I was writing this, though, I didn't think it was prophetic. I thought I was, I thought I was writing and representing what we thought, what we was listening to. It's 1994... You know what I mean? And um, industry rule number 4080, record company people are shady. I'm thinking like, yo, this is what these great legends I'm looking up to, who are the contemporaries, these greats I'm looking up to, this is what they, they're teaching us. I'm thinking the things that Guru was saying on Daily Operational, I'm, this is what I'm listening to you. You know what I mean? Because the 5% nation takes other steps to get through to the brothers on the corners with the reps. And I was thinking, who are those people? Have I seen them? Because I, I don't know. I'm just a high school kid. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I'm not in the street. I don't know. But I'm telling you, in the context of music now, a lot of people won't want to say this though. The DMX, the two DMX albums are so much simpler than the music of that time. And I, it's, it's not a diss. It's real. The music, musically, DMX's first two albums compared to the rest of the output in 98 is basically child's music. A kid's music. Basic breaks. That if somebody else had them, you wouldn't like it. Don't give me any shit. A lot of those beats, you wouldn't like them. And don't give me uh, uh, some of the big hits, the one you know, Rough Riders amp and anthem and thing like that. Go through that album now. The classics. I'm talking about the top tier albums that we can easily argue are greater than the work that he put out in '98. Even though the work you put out in India is seminal, it is necessary in your collection, and it is the biggest pop record albums, uh, hardcore albums of that year, 98. Gangstar's Moment of Truth. Now let's talk about music, though. Moment of Truth, Primo knows exactly what he's doing. Listen to You Know My Steez, though. Using a pop speaker to make a break beat. Songs like, uh, albums, excuse me, albums like Outcast's Equemini. 
you go, nah, soon he's just on his New York shit again. You know, he's going on bullshit. You know, he's such a sellout to New York. It's just a disgrace. I, I'm a disgrace to Medina right now. But the music on Equimini is way beyond. The sampling ability, the quality of the sound, it's not even close. The music that Lauryn Hill was putting. No, Sudis, it's not a rap album, though. It's an MC album, damn it. Lauryn Hill, you want to not call it a, a rap album, let's call it an MC album. And I, I you know, I, I hate this, though, because mainly men that say this shit. Because, nigga, if you could sing, you'd be singing like a motherfucker, though, and rapping at the same time. And I laugh, I laugh, because the biggest, when people tried to go pop with their hip-hop, how many songs do we have to hear another nigga sing? But when Lauryn Hill sings on her own songs and doesn't need you for a chorus, doesn't need 112 to sing the fucking hook. Eh, she's not an MC because she's singing a lot of the shit. That's MC, Master of Ceremony. Because the way it looks, though, a lot of people master in the ceremony by dancing like a damn, a damn coon. But the DMX albums are live albums. They are better live. They are designed for that audience. They are designed for the energy of it. But I'm telling you now that it was sold and it was written by the labels, their press releases, the media that wrote about it. It was sold to you as this is... The vibe that you want from Tupac, a Tupac-like vibe, except that he's alive right now, and he's authentically street. You know, the one issue that we had with Tupac is that he went to all ciphers, but now we want him a little bit simpler. We want him grimy from the street and a fish out of water everywhere else. I'm telling you now, <coughs> people love... <clears throat> MCs like DMX they love MCs like Ghostface because to so many they look like a fish out of water everywhere they go he's such a street nigga he's such a soulful brother everywhere he goes though it's so crazy it's like he, it's like oh my god like he actually does that shit everywhere oh my god like he's like ur, ur, everywhere oh my god like it's so grimy everywhere I love it it's such a vibe you know what I mean that's that's what made me so upset that I couldn't listen to those records. I didn't buy DMX's albums until years later. You know what I mean? Big pun. You say, if you want to put it in a context though, debut MCs, are we really just trying to like just... We have to put DMX in a context. This is the same year that debuted Pun. Not technically his debut because it was next year, but we started to see most deaf. Debut Lauren Hill solo, even though she's already out. And music was so much more complex. It was getting complex. DMX came and simplified the music just when it was getting really, 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 excuse me, heavy. As in heavy mental. I just want to see the disparity of 1998. DMX here, and then uh, heavy mental. That's the quality and the diversity of that year, 1998. This is exceptional. And that's why if I critique the Jay-Z records, uh, uh, DMX records, others, and put them into a context, is because it's a whole universe. It's not one thing. It's like saying, it's like the same thing as if we said Mark Anthony, like, oh man, Mark Anthony is incredible and stuff. But his music is baby stuff compared to the musicians of now. Now, the musicians out there playing more complex arrangements. The soneros with better soneros. So it's, it's a, 
when you go on social media, they're going to do that. They want to put it into a context. Oh, he, now he was the best. Now he's, that's, that's fine. But I'm giving you the science on the music. I'm telling it like it is. And it's disappointing. It's disappointing to me. You know what I mean? Black Rob. When I look at Black Rob, what disappoints me is because it was an MC that had the, the most intense real portrait of the streets and a lot of a lot of blocks that people didn't talk about either and as as a boricua he also had that way of merging the black and the brown hoods in a way that others couldn't he was doing that but what was puffy asking for hooks you know what i mean you you can't I'm sorry, you're not going to sit here and tell me that Life Story is a classic album. There's, there's no fucking way. It's the best work that he has. And if you want to remember him, that's where you start. You know what I mean? A very small discography. You know, only three albums. Duck Down was giving him that shot, though, in 2010. But I feel that he already was made to make pop hooks. And I feel that's a degradation of the artist, though. You know what I mean? How difficult must it have been to be an artist like Black Rob, though, when they want you to go in that studio and make woe again and again? Make that shit again. Make that shit again. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to look through this. Wait, there's a song. I'm going to tell you the one song, though, that to me holds the potential of Black Rob. And why Life Story, though, is like many Puff Daddy things, marred by the poppery. Listen, you know, it's funny because it, it features another one that Diddy swallowed, though. BR. Remember that song, BR? Listen to that song, BR. Listen to his cadence, though. The intensity. The visuals. He didn't get to explore that vibe. That's the whole point of an album, though. You get to explore your best shit. That's not what Life Story is. That's not the albums he was allowed to make. He had to make albums that, that went here, that went there. Oh, you like bitches? Then make a... Let's do something with J-Lo. Spanish Fly. We don't, we don't need that. We don't need that. In the history, we could go back and erase that. When I get my time machine, though, you'll see. I'll get rid of it, though, and you'll be fine. You know what I mean? Nothing's going to change, though. Dykeman's still going to have hookah and hoes. It will not change the landscape of anything. You know what I mean? You don't need a song with fucking Carl Thomas singing on this shit. You don't need the gimmicks... And let me tell you something. I'll say this, though. I always hated the mad rapper. Fuck the mad rapper. You know why? Because he ridiculed a lot of the real gripes that a lot of great artists had. And it made it was a way of ridiculing it and making the success that Diddy was portraying as the end-all, be-all of what this music is about. So fuck that corny fucking skit. Just like that shitty... Worst Tony Montana fucking imitation I've ever heard in my life, though, on those Jay Z albums, though. That shit doesn't even sound like Tony. Right? Doesn't sound like Tony. No one's gonna hear that and think it's Tony who's behind you. <laughs> fucking ridiculous. We didn't need to hear all this Diddy rapping on this shit. Most of the people on the down the line joint, they should have been off the line. So when I think of Black Rob, I think someone that wasn't able to reach his musical potential. And all you care about, and I'm saying you rhetorically, is that we got fun songs from a street nigga that's authentic. A1, check box. You know? 
But all we did was extract a, 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 a black man out of the streets and didn't prepare him to have another career, but just said, give us the streets that you're still immersed in. Give it to us, nigger. Give it to us, nigger. Give the street life. So they don't give you a career. They don't give you anything. And then we have to deal with the, the wrong history. Let's go into some wrong history, though. It's just beefing about the dark ages. And I'll continue to do my best here. Notorious Big, the documentary on Netflix. That's where you start with the hagiography. Okay? Wrong histories. Ten of it like it really didn't happen. Musical overrating. They started documentary and Diddy saying Biggie is the goat because I've never seen anything like it. I don't give a fuck what Diddy saw. What the fuck did he see? And then you know I I, I find it funny because the two guys that have the you know that that to me have lost credibility. Diddy and Mr. C, pause. They're the ones that keep telling you they never heard anything like it. Where the fuck were you in 1992-3 that you never heard something like Biggie? Like all great MCs, Biggie has a very unique combination. And yes, there's no one else like him. But there were many that were as good and like that. He said he's a spawn of rock, KRS, G Rap, and Kane. But we never heard anything like him. Uh, last I checked, KRS One was still in his prime those years. Go check the records. He just released Return of the Boom Bap. He's about to release a solo to self-titled 1995 album. G-Rap. When, when was G-Rap not at a peak? Every single 90s album from G-Rap is essential. You gotta have it. I, I want to know what it was that he was hearing. And, and by the way, I'm going to give you a little tidbit to explain this to you. You remember the part in the in the Biggie documentary where they juxtapose a freestyle he had and and play it over a jazz um, uh, a jazz drumming, okay? I just want to tell you something that didn't happen. That didn't happen. That never happened. He's actually not rapping to that. You know what I'm saying? You know what it's showing you? It's showing you that hip hop has a very jazzed cadence and has a rhythmic flow. But it is not next level because last I checked, Rakim literally writes his verses in a jazz cadence and in a jazz style. Go to the, uh, what was it, the ice. T um, documentary about MCs and select interviews when you can find them because he's expounded on this, Rakim. Biggie was an incredible talent and the un most unique thing about him to Diddy really was that Diddy got him. Diddy didn't get Kane. Diddy didn't get Ra. He certainly can't get Karis one. He didn't get any of the woo. He didn't get Nas. He got Biggie. And why, why is that important, what I just said? Because these ciphers all knew each other. Jay with the Damager, RZA, Nas, all these people knew each other. Just like today's hip-hop ciphers, though, we all know each other. All of us, like all these MCs and, and, and artists, the same thing back then. Diddy was able to put his cash chips in there, and he had a model to, to work on. 
He comes from seeing how Heavy D was sold, and he could do that with Biggie. A hardcore version of Biggie, uh, of, of Heavy D. It's funny stuff. Let me read you some th notes that I had. Some things to think about. I saw an interview with Tupac. And they're asking him whether he thinks he's a thug. You know, like people say, you think you're a thug. And he says that he was living in all these worlds. What I was mentioning before, right? But he says that we're all being pimped. It's how you're being pimped. And he said something very profound. He said, whether you work for someone else, though, or you're working by yourself, there's always something in your pimp because you always have to sell yourself. You're always selling something. And in that way, we always have to work to not be pimped. And one of the hardest things that people will fail to accept in this hip hop is that for a lot of the most hardcore, I'm talking about real street MCs that become great artists, their level of being used is just like a trick. And they are on the same level as that custy consumer. Let's keep it real. They are on the same level. Custy's here? No, no, no. Artist is not here just because he's street. No, he's a trick. And he's being used right here, and so is the Custy. They're eye to eye. And that's why you, an artist, respect the consumer. Respect that person that's buying your records. Don't look down on him. The consumers look down and sits like a fucking Custy nowadays. But all these artists that we love and stuff, when we look back at their history, they were struggling. And they were tricks. They were tricks for this label. They were tricks for the industry. And you know what's the dumbest excuse I hear? It's like, yo, that's just the way the industry is. Well, fuck that. Nothing changes when you accept it. You know what I mean? And every fan that says that, you're the f worst type of fucking listener. You're the worst type of listener because you're not a listener, though. You're living vicariously. And if you could rap like them, you'd bend over, pull down your pants, and say, sign me on the dotted line, no. That's the worst type of listener, the piece of shit like that. That's the type of industry we're in, though. So, you know, black excellence, did he did his thing. And you celebrate the winners, though, and not any of the people that he stepped on, on that ladder, that human ladder, that human ladder that they stepped on to get to the top. It's black excellence, Jay Bay and shit. Jay Bay, it's what a, it, black excellence. How dare you def defy that? And I'm telling you, you like that shit. I got a bag of shit music here that keeps blowing up. I got a bag, we got a bag of music from Beyonce that's the most famous, fakest, revolutionary shit. But nobody calls her out, right? Black Panther shit, all of that kind of shit. Nobody calls her out. No, nobody's there. Nobody's around. Black excellent. Oh, how dare you? You know what? So this is not just for you guys that are, that are sweating Jay all day. It's for you bitches too on that dumb shit. We're sweating black excellence, though. We look down on ourselves. Because, oh no, you know, we didn't couple our resources and buy all this shit, though. I decided to buy what fucking Beyonce told me to buy. She told me to buy this shit. And then I got to look down on myself because I didn't buy the right product here. Well, what do I buy? We got to stick together and shit. But the fucking people you follow, though, they're doing ads for every for the white man. So so where, where, where is it? What are we talking about here? And when you artists, these artists get big, they don't realize that they're talking to more people. They, they, gone are the days of the Tupacs that realize that. Gone are the day and use the media not to promote themselves, but to actually explain what they're trying to do. Because they were artists. 
And the bigger your audience gets, the more that people need an explanation. That's what the media is for. That's what journalism is about, music journalism. You'd gone to the days of the Ice T, we'd make a home invasion album. He knew that the white kids were listening. Everybody was being influenced, though. Didn't compromise the music, but boy, he'll explain it. Give you a great interview, a build. So now I look prophetic. I'm prophetic <laughs> because this music keeps getting shittier. <clears throat> to fight, to end with this on DMX on a positive note, I personally think, as a collector, the first two albums you have to have. If you're a deep collector, the first five. You know what I mean? And only because I, I really liked a lot of the songs after. You know what I mean? If you got if you had the joy of watching them live, and I didn't. And I told you I wasn't I wasn't into DMX. So I wouldn't have wouldn't have caught him live. You know what I mean? But I end with this though. It's these artists. We gotta support them by also critiquing what they're doing. We have to support them by saying, this is great work. You know what I mean? But now you are an orator of the people. Okay? You are not a sacrificial lamb to live out every aspect of the people and then disperse it into song. This is a big difference, and it's very difficult for artists like DMX to do that. It certainly feels like he died for the sins of many, though. Because people were eating it up. They loved the black trauma. They loved the hell that he was going through. But he made a lot of anthems. To me, DMX, somebody whose career is worth it just for that song slipping. How worthwhile is that song? Right? One of the greatest hip-hop songs I've ever heard. It's up there with, with a lot of the other great songs. And despite music that was lesser he still made great work so i find that incredible as i look back on the catalog you know what i mean so remembered in perfection dmx and black rob not just their work be revered in positivity but that we think about what went wrong and what we demand of ourselves as listeners as we have these forums of Twitter and that, not just that we demand people and we say oh we gotta buy a record but that we understand that if we expect people and these MCs to be voices of us that we also you know what I mean don't expect them to just wallow in the pity that they orate about And that's what happens with people like that. Talk about living and dying with the truth of your lyrics. And that, that's, what's, that's what's, what's upsetting. You know what I mean? And people talk about their fame and stuff, but it was at the expense of music that they could have made even better. Especially with Black Rob. They could have made even greater music without the confines and constrictions of bullshit pop and its uh, formats. I had some other things to talk about, though, but I didn't know I was going to wear like this. But this is the Dark Ages Volume 3 build. This is a book I'm working on to detail all of these things, to analyze them, to give you a history of these 2000s with the media, how it was to be in the media, how I developed my style and my element through those years and also analysis and science on music of all this music um, that happened in those 2000s and all the great music that was missed and putting everything into a context that I hope would uh, put things in greater perspective. Also in this the day airing of this show, it's also the anniversary of the returning to the essence of 
a, a top five favorite of all time, my, a hero to me and my own twin brother, the God Guru. It's a piece of the God remembered in perfection. So on that note, until next time, there'll be a lot more stories to tell, writings to recite, and records to rewind and reminisce. I'm your host, your brother Sunez. And as always, the Pi Show is a never respect fake broadcast. Peace. <laughs>